Okay, great. I, I think let's get started. Um, but just before we do, um, I wanted to also just introduce uh, my fellow um, roundtable uh, host, um, and that is Fred Musisi. Um, he's from Uganda. Uh, Fred, I'm not sure if you're able to just turn on your camera just to um, wave to everybody in the group. Um, but uh, Fred and I and the other um, few members that have been part of the group, they unfortunately um, can't be here today because of the time difference. We've got um, Megan who actually made it today. So well done, Megan. Um, Megan, do you wanna just put on your camera just to say hello to everyone? Uh, Megan is from China. Um, so she's oh, been doing everyone. a lot of work um, in, in the ECD space um, and we've been working together over the past few months since May last year. Um, we also have Beth Bai who's from the, uh, from the US and of course it's very early in the US at the moment so she's not, not able to join but she'll be leading the, the session happening um, later this evening. Um, then we also have um, Alute from um, Tanzania and um, Hewa also from, from Tanzania. So as you can see it has been a bit of a mix of different countries um, from various parts of, of the globe, um, different experiences. And so what we'd really like to do today is to share with you some of the processes that we've gone through as, as a group, both in terms of thinking about um, early years, education, how we've actually um, adapted and responded to some of the challenges, and, and also how we've used innovation in, in our respective countries. So um, for, for this particular session, um, the, the flow and the outline is, is going to go something like this. Um, I'll be telling you a little bit about what we've been doing over the past few months. Um, I will also be um, handing over to Fred to give some um, of his insights into some of the successes, the challenges, some of the um, issues happening in, in Uganda. So almost doing a deep dive in, into his, his particular country. I will do a short comparison in terms of looking at what, what South Africa has, has, has been doing. So just a very short and sharp in, um, uh, input, but then also doing at the end a very specific um, project um, overview and what I really am hoping to get from from our group is to get some input um, some conversation debate you know if this doesn't sound great or if you're thinking we completely have lost our our mind um, then we really would want to have that conversation with with all of you in 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 this room um, so it is something that has been ongoing for just over a year um, and we are in the middle um, of our scoping phase um, in in terms of this particular project and I'll be really, really interested to hear from all of you um, what your thoughts are, if you've done similar work back in your countries, and if you have any advice um, that you could possibly give to us. Um, so I, I want to start off with just giving a little bit of uh, feedback um, in, in terms of what we have been doing. But before I do that, um, I'm going to switch it around to everybody in, in the room. I see we are eight. Um, so if you could just introduce yourself, just your name, which organization you're from, and um, yeah, uh, that would be great as a start. So maybe let's start with Nicholas. Um, I, I do recognize the face, um, so please go ahead. Hi, I'm Nicholas Carlisle, and I'm the CEO of Para Zero, and we're an early years education initiative. Um, looking at this question, how do we ensure that children's well-being in an increasingly online world? Uh, so we're, we're bringing a very unique focus to the early years because 200,000 children across the world go online for the first time every day. The numbers are staggering. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Nicholas. Um, Kirk, can you go next? Thanks. Yes, I'm uh, Kirk Person. I'm, I'm based in Bangkok, Thailand uh, with SIL International, and I'm involved with uh, mother tongue based uh, education for ethnic minority groups. And this is my first time to join this particular uh, Salzburg uh, program. And so I'm just looking forward to, to learn and explore this, this model uh, that I think is so cool of policymakers from various countries sharing together. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kurt. Yeah, it's 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 actually super cool. Um, not something that that I've been exposed to often, um, because often we just stay in our little country, and I think that's that's not really a, a recipe for success. Um, Sarwat, over to you. Hello, hi. This is Sarwat. I'm from Brak IED in Bangladesh, and I'm involved in 
uh, working with the Rohingya community that we have here in Cox's Bazaar uh, in regards to providing pay based learning opportunities and mental health and well being opportunities to a, a marginalized community. And I am very excited to be here and to learn more from this uh, global platform. So, thank you. Great, Sarah, and welcome. And then, last but definitely not least, Faye, um, if you could go ahead. Thanks, Amara. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Faye Hobson. I'm an associate program director at Salzburg Global, um, working with Dominic and Corinna on the Education Policymakers Network, um, among other things. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here today and really looking forward to the presentation from um, Amara and the group as well. I should have added, I need to leave at the top of the hour. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was a longer group than that. No problem at all. Um, hopefully you'll be able to share some of your, um, your insights. Um, so then I'm going to kick off with the uh, formal pre presentation part. So we've uh, tried to make this um, as, as short as possible, but we wanted to also give you a flavor of what we've, we've been, been discussing as policymakers and, and also just to get your, your thoughts as well. Um, just give me a second just to bring my screen up. Okay, so basically we, um, as you know, uh, we've been looking at and focusing on um, new approaches to early years education. And I think some of the things that really has resonated with the group is, is that even though we are so different, so as I said to you, um, it's a group um, comprised of South Africans, um, Ugandans, Tanzanians, um, Chinese, and then also um, someone from, from the States. Um, and even though we're five different countries in very really different locations, what we've seen is that there has actually been um, six common threads that, is, that have come out through this particular group. And so, you know, we've, we've discussed various things and, and, for, and for us, some of those things, the first one is really looking at child outcomes. You know, I, I think across all of us, we, difficulty. I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms back up again. So feel free to join back into the groups you've already pre-selected. Seems like we are trying to pull back here. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, so as I was saying, we've, we've basically looked at six common threads um, running through all of these countries. The first being child outcomes and, and ready, being ready for learning in schools. And I think across all of our five countries, what, what we've seen is that most of our governments have in fact um, put this front and center of, of everything that, that we do. I, th I think the second thing is really about improving access and, and equity. And I wanna pause you a little bit just to say, you know, for us, um, particularly looking at the, the South African context and sort of where we've come from in, in, in apartheid times, this is front and center of what we are actually striving for and, and, and aiming for and making sure that everybody has equal opportunities as far as possible, no, no matter where they actually find themselves in, 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 in the country. And I think that, you know, if I look at my own region, um, just over 50% of Okay, let's uh, try this one more time. Um, and and could you share your PowerPoint again? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm- Get I'm to your PowerPoint. Right no, no problem, let me just get there. Um, okay. Um, is it visible? It seems to be on. Okay, <clears throat> brilliant. So as I was saying, you know, in, in our region alone, when, when looking at improving access and, and, and equity, um, just over 50% of our children are in ECD, and then about 70% or 72% of them are actually in what we call grade odd, which is really pre-primary. So interesting to note is that, um, and I'm not sure exactly how it works for, for your countries, but um, ECD or early learning is actually not part of the school system uh, yet. We have made a concerted effort now to actually transfer that function over to the Department of Education. Um, so previously it was known as a social development thing. They've now made the decision that um, we are now going to be transferred over um, to form part of the, the education system. And so that has various implications, which I'm not going to go into that right now, but just to say that there is a vast inequality even between teachers in a school system versus um, ECD practitioners in an informally or, or loose kind, kind of um, setting. And, and so that has caused a little bit of issues um, both within the ECD sector, but also within the school system. So this is something that we are currently gra grappling with in South Africa and the change is going to be from one April um, this year. 
So we'll see and we'll um, keep posted in terms of how that actually pans out in, in the end. But I do know it is going to be quite a difficult transition to make. Um, but I think it's a good step in terms of getting to that, uh, that particular goal of actually improving access and, and equity. And so the third area is really about um, improving the quality of care and education. And so quality really comes through strongly across all five different countries, um, both in terms of moving from a place um, where perhaps some of the challenges were that um, because of access, quality of care couldn't happen as, as effectively as, as we would have wanted it. And, and so that rings true not only for, for the developing countries, but even, um, for example, in, in the States. And I think that that has also been a very sort of um, dedicated goal of what, what the US is also trying to do. I, I think the fourth area looking at public investment. So when I look across and, and Fred is gonna tell you a little bit about how they've done it in, in Uganda. But in South Africa, what, what we've been doing is um, actually giving relief to ECD practitioners um, as a result of the, the pandemic. So what that, that basically meant is that ECD practitioners, and so these are like, you, you'll find like an auntie um, who set up an ECD daycare in her house. Um, and so that's really, you know, it ranges from formal um, institutions, so like big ECD centers, but also out of center programs, which form part of the general sort of ECD landscape in South Africa. And, and then those aunties, you know, in informal settlements who have set up something to basically make sure that kids in the community have a space to go when they care. care their caregivers and parents are actually going to work. So this has been, you know, quite a relief for those, e for the ECD practitioners, as well as for the ECD principals, um, because what they get, I mean, it's very minimal. We're looking at just under a hundred um, dollars just to be able to, um, you know, survive. Um, so, so what the, um, the lockdowns have actually done is obviously closed most of the ECDs. Um, as we're currently um, talking now, most of them have reopened, but a lot of them have closed down as, as a result of the pandemic. So it is really thinking through how do we actually create the investment which actually um, has a great return at, right at the end. And I think at the moment, we are kind of in a space where we have facilities, but we don't necessarily have a, a strict um, curriculum. Things are very informal. Um, the only thing that is legislated in, in, in terms of receiving funding from the government is that if you want to open up an ECD center, you need to be able to comply with certain legislations. And so that means that um, health and safety regulations need to be in order. You need to have um, you know, a, a set number of teachers, um, you need to have a set number of, of kids, but that is sort of really minimal at the moment. And most of our ECDs, as I say, are, are informal. Um, the fifth area, which is really something that I've been working quite closely in, um, in, in terms of social and, and emotional development. And what we've been doing is sort of looking at how we can improve social and emotional development um, through behavioral change. And I think this is for the part both of the children, but then also of parents and caregivers, as well as ECD um, practitioners. And so this also re relates to not only sort of looking at a fixed curriculum, but also, you know, learning through play. How do people and understand each other? How do parents and caregivers interact with their children and how do the ECD practitioners interact with, with the kids that they are serving? And, and then the sixth area is about this um, and, and, and linking to the standards and, and curriculum is about how do we actually provide um, uh, professional development and professional standards for those in the sector. So whether that is principals who are in charge and form more of a business focus within an ECD, or whether it, it is the ECD practitioners them, themselves, how do we get them on an equal footing to be able to provide quality um, um, curriculum and, and quality play through learning, um, learning through play rather, and, and being able to provide them with, with this particular um, skill. And so that's really what, what we've been discussing. I, I think what we found and what, what was really interesting is that even though we are so different in many, many ways, we have great similarities running across the five countries. And so even if um, a country like the US, as an example, um, has been doing ECD for, for quite some time, they, they, there are others. Um, for example, Megan can, can tell you about the Chinese example where um, the changes have been so progressive and so unexpected 
um, but really interesting in terms of outcomes. Um, so I think that has been something that that I've certainly learned um, as as we've gone on our journey over the past few months. Um, so with that, I'm I'm going to close this part of it and and then hand over to um, Fred just to give his input. Um, but I also want to pause if anybody has any particular questions that they'd like to ask at this point um, before we move on to to the next phase. I want to say it's a really uh, <clears throat> helpful analysis you've done there. I love, I love this slide. I love the six themes that you've picked out. I think you're exactly right on the money here. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, this was I. I can't actually take credit for this. This is actually Beth Bai. Um, so we've we've basically borrowed it from her, but we'll be saying and and giving the same message, but but completely agree. I think that you know what really struck me was that even though you know we we are on the same continent. I mean, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, but we're so different in, in many ways. Um, and it is very interesting as to how our governments have, have actually approached um, ECD outcomes, um, funding models, how to actually do things, what curriculum. And, and so I think that has been useful for, for me. And I think that the most interesting example, and if you're able to join um, later on, um, China has a very, very interesting example, and, I, and I'm sure um, Megan can give you a little bit of tidbits there, um, just in terms of what they, they've been doing as well. Um, so thanks for that, Nicholas. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm going to hand over to Fred, um, just to take us through his presentation. Um, and please, um, if you have any questions, just jot them down and we'll take them right at the end. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know whether the screen is on. Uh, not yet, Fred. Uh, would you like me to share your presentation or, or are I you comfortable? Do, do it for me. Do it for me. Okay, sure. I'll do so. So, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I'm Fred from Uganda. Like she has presented, we have been looking at uh, challenges and uh, suggesting innovative ways on how we can improve accessibility to ECD. I'm still waiting for the screen. Not yet there. I'll be with you in a sec. Okay. So I'm presenting this briefly. Uh, first of all, I gave you the location of Uganda. Uh, what is uh, Uganda? You can go to the next slide. Uh, Uganda is found in East Africa, uh, in the center of Africa. She's a landlocked country. She has got about 45 million people. Uh, with those 45 million, we, we have a, a number of issues that are concerned with the early childhood education that we shared, which are quite interesting. And if we want to have innovative ways, we wanted to have what we can share from uh, others. Uh, Amma, can I go to slide two? Because I can't move slides, eh? Yeah, mm. you, you, are, you are on slide two now. Mm. Can you see it? Yeah, I'm seeing, but I can't move. We could just be moving them very fast uh, in the next, next 10 minutes uh, so that these people can see what we have. So do you want me to move forward or would you like me to pause? Yeah, move, move. Today? That is okay. okay. Uh, I can continue the mine here, mm -hmm. but you could do... Uh, help them move them forward. So I'm on introduction, I was saying Uganda is a landlocked country. It has an estimated population of about 45 million, which is equivalent to 0.59% of the total world population. And what is interesting, 55% of the population is below 18 years. Uh, our education system comprises of early child programs that caters for the aged three to five years. Uh, followed by seven year primary education, a four years ordinary level education, a two years advanced education, and the final tier of three to five years, which is tertiary education. And with the exception of uh, the pre primary section, all these are nationally examined and certificates awarded. Uh, currently, we have about 16,741 teachers handling ECE, and these are mainly in the private sector. Uh, we do have a curriculum for this area, 
uh, a learning framework has been done, which is for three to six years, and is developed by the Uganda National Curriculum Development Center. Uh, however, this learning framework is not well disseminated, and over 90% of the teacher training institutions for ECD are private. Uh, their training lasts for about one year. So, in other words, the central government has very little control of ECD. Unfortunately, in Uganda, there is high demand for this. And this has been so because during the pre-colonial era, era uh, we had the extended family system where the children will be cared for by this extended family network. However, with the ev evolving family and community structures, uh, then this is changing. Uh, the extended families are declining. Then we're also suffering from the effects of urbanization and work driven migration. Moreover, increasingly, many of our women are now participating in the labor market. So this has led many people wish to take children to these centers. However, despite the above that we need, uh, the EC is on high demand. Unfortunately, uh, currently, only 18.7 and only one out of every five children between the ages of three to five years can access pre-primary services in Uganda. This is low below the regional. Our neighbors in Kenya have enrollment at around 53%, and our other neighbors have got 35%, and other neighbors of Rwanda have got 29%. So Uganda standing at 18.7 is really low. And we have attributed this to 80% uh, of our population cannot afford fees shared in the pre-primary. These ECD centers are unevenly distributed. Many of them are found in urban centers. Therefore, in a large part of the rural areas, uh, they are not there. And then, like I have said, in the past, many of the people never went to these centers. So most parents, especially those in rural areas, do not take ECD training as an important area. So that has got a negative impact on accessibility. What has been the main challenges in this area? First of all, we have poor financing. Although the Ministry of Education and Sports in the country has a budget to cater for the education sector, only 0.05% of it goes to ECD. And this is only for policy formulation and dissemination and possibly a few areas of quality assurance. Uh, other challenges have been the poor home environment where there is no exposure for reading materials or incentives to read. Uh, we have inappropriateness of learning materials, absence of well-equipped outdoor space and outdoor time. Uh, more time during the week is devoted to book or classwork. And this is unfortunate that most of our ECD centers have become academic. Uh, they think uh, they are simply preparing these youngsters for serious primary education. So a lot is put aside. In addition, because the majority of them, in fact, virtually of them, all of them are owned by the private sector because the Ministry of Education and, or the central government does not own these centers. So there is poor staff remuneration. More than, uh, say, 80% of the staff involved here do earn less than 100 US dollars a month. And there's also inadequate sanitation. Uh, because there's a lot of, there's little money set aside, there's even inadequate inspection and supervision of these ECD centers. And like I've said before, the curriculum is highly academic and the classroom schedules are inflexible. Uh, to make matters worse, 
there is even lack of proper assessment uh, tools for these two to five years. Because these centers are owned by private sector, uh, each people tend to assess these kids differently. So this brings about issues. Uh, at first, I talked about the curriculum that has been put in place as a guideline. Unfortunately, I also said it is not well disseminated. Consequently, there is lack of common syllabus. Okay, I think while, while Fred is sort of um, sorting out these connectivity issues, um, I think one thing that Fred was saying about sort of no assessment tools was really interesting because we often have a very sort of similar issue. Um, and, and I think because in, in our case in South Africa, we don't necessarily prioritize that. So it isn't governed or legislated. Um, sorry, Nicholas, I see your, um, your note, no problem at all. Um, so hope you found this useful and thanks for, for your contributions and um, we'll probably see each other soon. Yeah, no, just say, can we stay in touch somehow? Are you going to connect us all? Or? Yes, definitely. Happy to yeah. do so. And I'm sure Faye, Faye would also be, be able to do that. I'd love um, to. Thank yeah, you. happy to connect everyone, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. So as I was saying, you know, for, for us in South Africa, the, the assessment tools are, it's almost like a luxury for us and, and we don't necessarily build it into any um, kind of budget. So currently what we're really trying to push and I've been a strong, strong proponent of is to look at when kids get to grade one, how do we actually assess their learner readiness? And, and so yes, the, this happens in um, bits and bobs, but it's more about how do we actually make this a standardized, a standardized assessment? And, and I was really interested to know what are the current situations in, in other countries? Because you know, for, for us, it's, it's very um, informal, as I said, um, so it would be really good to hear how, how other countries have in fact instituted in this um, if, if they've done so. Um, so I don't know if anybody on the call um, has anything they'd like to share um, about their specific um, countries or, or regions, uh, just to be able to give that information to us. Megan, maybe let me call on you just to open up things um, and just uh, give your perspective in terms of how um, China has actually looked at assessment tools, um, if they've looked at, at assessment tools, and maybe just give us some more um, input there. Okay, I will share my screen. And can you see my PowerPoint? You can yeah. see my slide? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and do. I'll make a brief uh, introduction to, the, to some uh, innovation of Chinese preschool education. And first, I'd like to introduce some basic uh, situation according to the data of 2020. Um, there are 291,715 uh, kindergartens in China. And uh, mm, there are 48 million, 182,634 uh, children in kindergartens. That's a very big number. <laughs> and among uh, these children, about nearly half of these children are in the private kindergartens. And this uh, bring a lot of problems. For example, um, the kindergarten, the education quality, quality of different types of kindergarten is uneven. For example, some private kindergartens, they pursue excessive profits and have lower teacher qualification. And the inclusive resources provided to parents are insufficient. And the proportion of preschool education costs um, borne by the families is uh, is high. And there are uh, great differences in the investment between the local governments and they uh, 
they will invest according to the economy uh, to put the money in education. So the central government uh, have a policy in 2018. Um, this aimed that by 2020, the growth enrollment rate in the three-year preschool will reach uh, 85. And uh, the 80% uh, 80, 80 of the children should be in the uh, public kindergartens and all the inclusive private kindergartens. Uh, for the inclu inclusive private kindergartens, that means uh, the kindergarten, which will not uh, uh, charge a lot they will charge just uh, like the the public kindergartens just uh, a very low price for the uh, parents to put their children into the kindergarten and also by 2020 we will uh, train uh, 200 and 200,000 teachers and the principals for the uh, uh, kindergartens and also uh, the government put a lot of um, limits for the private kindergartens. Uh, for example, standardize the development of private kindergartens and conduct classified registration re re of non-private private kindergarten or for uh, private profit private kindergartens within a time limit. Uh, so now since it's 2022 and at present the above indicators have been completed and for uh, for for the further uh, management, our government have the legislation of prime preschool education law is in progress. Um, the preschool education has been uh, com comprehensively standardized mainly from the following aspects. The first is improve the hosting system, increase the supply. A supply of resources, and second, in improve the investment system. The third is cl uh, clarify the management of system, pro uh, promote the standardized operation of kindergartens, and fourthly, is strengthen the uh, awareness of quality. The fifth is strengthen the legal responsibility, strengthen the supervision, and strive. Uh, to solve the problem of um, management ability. And these are uh, some um, policies of the uh, central government we did to ensure that the uh, preschool education can develop very well. And also uh, from the, um, the education work for the kindergartens can do, the first one is uh, strengthen the link between kindergartens and the primary school. And according to the government, we have uh, another policy just uh, last year, the 2021. Uh, uh, we will uh, compre comprehensive uh, promote the implementation of school pre preparation and adaption education in kindergartens. And also we should change the situation of attaching too much importance to knowledge and uh, pre pre preparation and exceeding teaching standards and leading study. Uh, also, uh, I, I don't know if you have heard about the Angie game. Uh, I just find some pictures from the internet. Uh, it, is, it was launched in Angie, uh, Zhejiang from China, and it, uh, it is uh, some kind of games that are um, aiming at the learning through play and it uh, use a lot of natural resources and the children can play outdoor games independently. And so for the teachers, they just observe and support uh, when the, the children need. So uh, 
in this kind of uh, uh, teaching method, uh, uh, it can some uh, some uh, solve the problem that some uh, teachers are not so well qualified. Uh, for for the teachers, they can just watch and observe, and when uh, children need, they, the the teachers can give them some help. So they will um, this will help our government to uh, have more teachers who can work in kindergartens. And uh, these are the things that I want to share with you. And uh, I will, uh, yeah, I will talk more later uh, because I haven't finished this slide yet. No problem, Megan. I I think you you gave us much more than than what we asked for. For so so thanks for that. I think you, it it was really interesting. Some of the things that that stood out for me was sort of looking at the gross enrollment rate in China being being eighty five percent. I mean that that's incredibly high. Um, when you compare that to South Africa, it's it's only fifty percent. So it really is, um, you know, it's thinking through the Chinese government really putting an emphasis on on early childhood development. And I think also the uh, the Angie game, I thought it was, was really interesting because it speaks to some of the other, um, you know, ways and methods of teaching um, and, and some of the world of schools also do similar things in terms of using natural resources, thinking about it, education through through sustainable development. So I think this is really interesting. And as you say, it, it also gives those teachers who um, do not have the proper qualifications an opportunity to kind of simplify what they do while still learning through play, which I think is so important for for early learning um, and and education so thanks thanks for that Megan um, I see Fred is back so okay. we've actually have done three countries which which is great um, mm -hmm. and so Fred I'm I'm going to let you wrap up um, your section because then I want to move on to a little bit of a, of a short discussion and please don't feel um, as though you need to wait for me to say that if you want to say something please jump in um, anybody else in in the room um, we're trying to make this as in, interactive as possible and stop you know hearing our how voices mostly um so if you do have any questions at this point please do um jump in no, let's move good. on yeah. okay all right fred so maybe you can just um wrap up what you were saying um i'm assuming that there was some connectivity issues sorry that that yeah. you were kicked out um yeah. but maybe just wrap up your section and then i will um open up again and then move into some of the um the behavioral elements that i'll be talking about um so over to you fred thank you yeah uh, I, I, when I broke off, I was on the main, main challenges we are looking at in Uganda. They are facing for early childhood education. And uh, there are, like I talked about, inadequate inspection and supervision because the Minister of Education, the central government, does not run the schools. They are all in the private sector. And that uh, the different stakeholders are isolated and there's weak networking among uh, the people who provide quality education to our ECE. In terms of especially financing, and uh, technical know-how how, and skills, and monitoring and evaluation is also very poor. Uh, there, but however, there are some solutions that are being sought uh, to make this uh, more accessible, aware of the vital role this plays. So currently, and there has been an effort of expanding professional involvement of ECE service providers and actors. Uh, there has been an increase, an advocate for increase in uh, allocation of financial resources. Uh, there has been an implementation and enforcement of intersectorial policies in ECD intervention. Now, the Minister of Education, together with the Ministry of Gender, uh, are working together to see that this goes on. Uh, a new policy has also been just passed where all ECD providers must be graduates. Uh, because we said that there was poor training of teachers and most of the training was mainly in the hands of the private sector. Now, efforts have been made that uh, these can acquire uh, a, a degree and offer, although this is also still debatable as to whether it is the qualification alone that can be 
can, that can improve, but this has now become a policy in the country. Uh, uh, there was also an effort of improving the teacher remuneration and also creating public awareness of the importance of ECD, especially among the rural areas. Uh, also, uh, as a way of increasing accessibility, because I said, despite the demand, the need for ECD centers, uh, accessibility was still low. So some of the innovative ways we are thinking up about in this country is to establish, because the government about two years ago passed a policy where all its government schools should have a nursery section. However, because some of these schools are found in distant areas, these kids cannot move. So to a school which is about half a kilometer or so on foot and then come back. So what is being thought now is where there's a large community, these ECD centers are going to be established, like where there are markets, market centers, then an ECD center is put there so that these kids can go there. And then expanding on the creating, uh, expanding and creating collaborative networks between the Ministry of Gender, that of education, and that of local government. Because in each local government, we have an office in charge of education. So now they're strengthening and expanding this collaboration. Uh, finally, uh, we have also talked about expanding professional development. Now, meaning uh, there's in-service training of these early teachers, the teacher trainers of these early children, so that they can really pick up uh, where they, how they can improve and also showing the importance and possibly reduce on the academic content and emphasize uh, the emotional skills. So there is a big debate on the pedagogical uh, skills that could be adapted in order to improve accessibility and also improve the quality of early childhood in the country. Uh, I beg to stop there for now. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much, Fred, for, for sharing that. Um, I wanna throw it out now to the rest of the room if there are any questions of clarity or anything that you might have wanted to ask Fred um, in his input. I don't see any indications. That, it, that obviously means that you were very clear, Fred, and that everybody understood what you were saying. So, so well done. I, I think for me, what, what stood out was that, you know, your, your ECD curriculum is um, quite academic. And so that also is a little bit of a departure from most other countries. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that's also, a, you, one would think, and some people might think that if you regularize something, it, it becomes better, but actually perhaps it doesn't. And especially for, <laughs> for, for the early years, you know, um, kids yes. don't necessarily, they can't sit in a classroom of 20 people and, and learn something. They need to be out playing. They, they need to be learning um, through touching and playing and, um, you know, doing all sorts of things. So also thinking about how to think about having some sort of structure with, without actually looking at how academic you, you can actually make it may also be a, a useful balance. So I do see that as something that, that you are trying to do, <clears throat> both in terms of training your, your teachers, but also looking at some of the, the pedagogical stuff that you need to do in order to make um, ECD education actually quite practical for both the learners and, and the ECD um, practitioners. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is to talk a little bit about um, some of the other elements of the CD <laughs> and, and sort of what, what that, that, that actually means. Um, so as I said, we've been exploring um, some of the work um, around behavior change and, and also looking at how we can think about um, quality in, in interactions between uh, parents and caregivers as well as their children, um, either that, that they serve or, or that that forms part of the, their particular household. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share my screen and just give you a little bit of feedback on, on this particular project. As I said right at the, the beginning, um, this is um, a work in progress. So we have not um, yet 
come to a final conclusion and, and finished our research. So I'd be very interested to hear from, from all of you, some of your thoughts, um, some of the stuff that, that had you've picked up and anything that you may want to contribute. So we've been um, thinking about how we can use a behavioral approach um, to improve our ECD outcomes in, in, in our region. So just to tell you a little bit about um, a little bit more about the, the actual project. So um, we have a behavioral science unit um, within in our government um, and we've been doing work and so I, I head up that, that, that particular unit and we've been working um, on this particular work since 2012. Um, so we have been doing it for, for quite some time in, in various fields, in, including education. But this one is our first one looking at early childhood development. So last year, um, in, in the midst of the, the, the pandemic, we, we thought about how we could actually use behavioral science to improve e ECD outcomes. I, I think one of the things that stood out for us was that during the, the pandemic, people were really struggling to get their kids to, um, to, to an ECD center. Um, lots of people had, had lost their jobs um, and so didn't actually have money to send their kids to school or, or even to, to ECDs at the time. And, and because of various lockdowns, um, there was a moratorium actually um, saying that ECDs and of course schools had to close down. Um, so we really wanted to figure out um, whether behavioral science could actually be appropriate for offering new ways of improving ECD outcomes. And, and so this is particularly looking at parents and caregivers, ECD managers, um, educators, as well as other stakeholders. Um, so where we were at last year is we actually got to a point um, where we wanted to un uncover and almost do what we're calling a scoping exercise um, into the specific challenges that were feasible to actually address these behavioral innovations. So we wanted to find out what would be the biggest impact or what would make the biggest impact um, um, on, on children's developmental outcomes. So we've used a methodology which has been introduced yeah. by an NGO um, called I Ideas42. Um, they are based in, in, um, in the States, but have worked across the globe, um, uh, mainly in, in developing countries. And we've been partnering with them um, since the very beginning. So part of the, the methodology actually looks um, something like this. And you can see this um, at the bottom of your screen, where we go into a defined phase, which, which is really about uncovering the the, the, the problem, actually doing the, the scoping and finding out what are those behavioral barriers that, that, that actually prevent um, caregivers and ECD um, practitioners of, of actually having quality in interactions with their kids, but also looking at just the general sector as, as a whole. Um, we finished our phase one of our field work. Um, could we just all mute ourselves? I'm, I'm getting some feedback from, from somebody. I'm not sure. Anyway, so um, what we've done now is to look at our, our, our fieldwork phase and, and we've completed about 15 in-depth interviews. So yes, this may seem like, like quite a little, but what it does show you is, is that with, with each of these interviewees, we actually spend between one to two hours just really un unpacking some of the challenges that, that they face. So we work very, very closely with, with the implementing partner. Um, and we had a conversation with um, experts within the NGO sector working on, on ECD. We um, had conversations with practitioners. So looking at the, um, the, the ECD practitioners themselves, teachers and principals. We, we also looked at K Caregivers them, themselves, because also they have a lot to say in terms of how they actually, um, you know, interact with the kids, what prevents them from, from, from actually sending their kids to ECDs. Um, some of those things that we may not necessarily know of because we are living in a completely different um, community. So, so some people are very, very poor and come from very, very impoverished um, backgrounds. And it is really trying to understand why and what are the drivers, the behavioral drivers of not sending your, your kid to school? So is it as an example, um, not being able to afford the transport? Is it as an example, you stay too far away from, from an ECD center? Is it because you think if you're sending your, your kids to an ECD that um, they might catch COVID as an example? So these were kinds of the conversations that we were having to really drill down and understand what are those context specific um, things that, that are preventing 
um, all of these stakeholders to actually become more involved and provide um, more quality ECD provision. And so some of our, our results um, looked particularly at, um, you know, whether we could actually, you know, have, have, have a promising opportunity to use applied behavioral science to uncover um, actionable insights. And, and, and so here, what we wanted to find out is that looking at a caregiver's in environment, what influences them to take or make certain decisions and, and take certain actions? And, and so really our goal here is to think about how do we actually develop context-specific solutions to really improve ECD outcomes for young children. And so very simply put, we want to understand what prevents people from doing what they're supposed to do um, and finding out if we can intervene through a behavioral intervention. So what we found is, is that um, caregivers of all genders, and so male and female, do not consistently engage in quality interactions with their young children, nor do they consistently send their children to ECD centers or programming. The third thing we found was that ECD practitioners do not always engage in quality interactions with children, and that male caregivers in particular do not always engage in activities that support their children's development. So there were various sort of reasons for these um, key insights. But if we look at male caregivers as an example, they predominantly um, what came through our research is that male caregivers actually don't uh, feel that it's their responsibility to be looking after the kids. They don't feel that playing with their children in the, is, ne is necessarily a male role. And this is obviously, you know, making sure that they uh, stick with a social norm within the, their community. So culture plays a very big role in terms of understanding why male caregivers, as an example, don't always engage. And so, yeah, I'm specifically talking about those in poorer communities. Um, and I think that what we found from an ECD practitioner perspective was that um, because most of these practitioners are dealing with 30 people, um, 30 children in, in a classroom, it is often difficult to have that one-to-one -one interaction with, with, with kids. And I think, you know, some of the, um, the other things I talked about earlier about why um, caregivers don't actually um, send the, and, and, and parents send their children to ECD centers um, is because they feel that, you know, I didn't go to an ECD center, why should I be sending my, my, my children? Also, there is an element of, of cost, I don't have money um, to pay for this, unfortunately, I, I won't be able to, to send their kids there, and if I can look after my own kids, um, I will just do it myself. So, you know, these kind of contextual factors which actually play a big part of actually making making sure that we are achieving um, our, our ECD um, outcomes as, as a whole. So this is where we are at right now, which is really um, phase two. And so here, yeah, what we now want to do is to look at those barriers. And, and so those one, two, three, four barriers, um, and then look at what is driving them. Um, to be able to think about, okay, what do we need to actually change? What, um, what in the environment is feasible for us to change as a government. So what you'll be doing in phase two is to actually have a diagnosis um, uh, with each of these sort of um, groups and, and find out and dig a little bit deeper into why. Why are you not sending your, your kids to school? What are those things that are in inhibiting you from, from actually doing this? And, and then trying to work with that behavior to be able to say, okay, how do we actually, from the data that we've collected, um, how do we then look at specific interventions that we can take forward and pilot to see what would work best in your society or, or, or in your context? So we are currently working with, with two demographic profiles, um, both in, in, in the Western Cape, to really think about how we can shape it um, to a specific community. So we, because of the apartheid legacy, um, we have had very separate communities for a long time. Unfortunately, that has um, stayed around for, for many, many years and we still have a highly unequal society. So what that means is that your context um, is in a black community or your context is, is in a um, what we know as a colored community and you really need to understand where people are coming from, their culture, their social norms in order to be able to help them do the things that they do actually want to do. So that's really a little bit about um, this particular project. Um, it, it is, as I said, still in progress and um, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to give you some more feedback as, as we go along.
so that's really it for from from my side. Um, I now want to just open up a little bit um, and ask if anybody has any uh, specific questions or any points of clarity that they might want to um, ask at this point. I will also make the um, presentation available. Um, and just for you, if you have any further follow-ups, you're welcome to reach out to me as well. Um, yeah. I don't know, Fred or um, Megan, do you have anything that you'd like to share at this point? No, I was just impressed by what you have presented because in this country, we are also going to have uh, an education review that has been launched and they are going to review the education system. And like you had observed in, the, in my presentation that our area is too academic. It is really too academic, yet we have had reforms in upper primary and even secondary level high school. We are having a change where we are moving from content-based curriculum to uh, skills, competence, and so on. So what we think really is to go back also to the early childhood and then find ways where we are going to emphasize role play, uh, uh, development of those emotional skills so that these kids can later be good, or can develop better personalities. So we are I'm interested in the, in the study you are carrying out and uh, we look forward to finding its results later. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Fred. Um, Sarwat, I, I wanted to get your, your perspective, you know, from, um, from, from where you are and just think about sort of if there are any specific things that you've noticed or, or observed in, in what we presented. Sarwat, are you there? All right, I, I think Sarwat is le uh, it's probably some connectivity issues. Um, Timothy or Rish, Rinshu, is there anything that you maybe want to contribute at this point? Oh, I see Kirk has just um, come back now. Okay, great. Kirk, please go for it. I see your hand is raised. Yeah, so I just actually had a, a question for, for Fred um, uh, related to how you're talking about how they become so academic in the ECD. Um, and I know that uh, on the issue of language, there has been a lot of debate in Uganda between local mother tongues and English and Kishwahili and so forth. Uh, what are most of these ECDs doing in terms of language? Are they working in local languages or trying to be more academic and trying to teach the kids English too. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's a very good observation that I didn't even include in my presentation. Yeah, uh, because these uh, centers are mainly owned privately and they are academic. The medium of our presentation is English. Medium of instruction is still English. And if a kid finishes the three years in a center and cannot greet and speak English at, at home, then they'll say that center is doing nothing. So go there, speak English, be fluent in it, and then that is the learning. We have attached the speaking of English to being one, being intelligent and achieving the academics goal. So there's still that debate. Because even as you have observed, rightly observed, when in the primary section, they introduced what they call thematic curriculum where regions would teach in their local language, like say where I come from, central, Buganda, where we are supposed to teach in Uganda. Many parents and other stakeholders opposed this in preference to continue with the teaching of the, the use of the English language. So we really still have a big, big, big obstacle in this area. Thank you for your observation, please. No, that's, that's actually a very astute um, observation, Kirk. I think, you know, and it's super interesting because we take a very different stance. So we take the view that you should be teaching and learning in your mother tongue. 
um, and we only change over to English um, in grade three. So you will find in an ECD, particularly in, in, in our environment, that you would have um, Kosa, which is basically one, one of the three official languages here. You would have people speaking in Afrikaans, you, you would have people speaking in, in other dialects completely, so, so, so Swahili as an example, because there are so many people coming from, from the rest of the um, continent to South Africa, and so there is a big mix between um, locals and, and sort of um, foreign nationals as well. So this has been um, some of the, the interesting kind of overlaps of culture and, and language. And you also find that some of the uh, foreign national children now are able to speak um, South African languages um, and actually vice versa. So this has been a little bit of a melting pot because um, of the mix and diversity with, within the country. So this is a very interesting observation. And, and I think that what we've struggled with, um, ad admittedly, is that when kids get to grade three and the swap happens between um, the mother tongue um, in instruction to English, um, a lot of our kids actually fail because it is a very different. Welcome back everyone to the uh, main room. I'm sorry for the breakout disruptions at the very beginning of that session. We're not totally sure what happened. Some sort of ghost in the Zoom machine, but thank you for bearing with us.